Well, good evening, everybody, and good afternoon in the United States. Good evening in Europe. Um, welcome to the Harassus panel titled Pandemic Impact on U.S. and Global Education. The theme itself is dramatic um, at its core, given everything that's unfolding in the world around us currently. Um, there is an exceptional collective of panelists with us this evening to unpack uh, this very, very broad topic, which we would like to keep sort of somewhat contained. And the two key points that will be asked are what are the critical points that must be covered to enable people to achieve their limits, perhaps in context of the pandemic's uh, impact, and what new pieces will future-proof learning and employability skills, promoting awareness of gender and diversity needs worldwide. Joining us today, we have the esteemed panel, Dr. Vaira Vika Freiberger, uh, Sir George Berwick, Professor Michelle Notari, and Peje Emelson uh, from Sweden. So I'd like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to all of you and to all the guests or visitors as they may be, and for any future recordings of this conversation. So perhaps without further ado, if I may, um, I'd like to just briefly introduce each of the speakers. Um, we will maybe for a short 60 seconds or so discuss the impact of the pandemic on our personal circumstances and how that for a following few minutes might interact with what the questions this evening are and how education and the disruptions as a result of the pandemic can allow us in some ways to reset teaching and the educational approaches. Um, if I may begin with um, the esteemed Excellency Dr. Vaira Vika Freiberger, who is president of Latvia, president of the World Leadership Alliance Club de Madrid until 2019, uh, special envoy on the UN reform and official candidate for the United Nations Secretary General in 2006, and uh, astonishingly a member, board member or patron of about 30 international organizations and five academies. I've had the great pleasure of listening to you speak frequently and always incredibly impre impressed by your wonderful intellect. So um, if I may ask and Dr. Freiberger, if we could just uh, ask you to perhaps address the sense of your own experience of the pandemic and how that relates perhaps to some of these elements of educational changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have been spending the past two, two and a half years uh, out in our countryside house uh, and uh, spending my time in front of the screen uh, in, in various international and national uh, events. Um, I happen to have been uh, spending two of these years in a group um, convened by UNESCO and chaired by the president of uh, Ethiopia, uh, Madame Salaberg, who... Uh, uh, our group has just finished our report. It has been uh, submitted uh, and uh, is uh, available through UNESCO. And it's about the futures of education, uh, a new so social contract for education, as, as our group uh, sees it uh, for the future. Uh, a, a very general, uh, broadly, uh, with broad brush sort of, a uh, painted picture of how we would like to see changes in the education of the future. Uh, and the report is available. So when you have a free moment, uh, I, I would encourage you to talk about the UNESCO report, Futures of Education. I also spent my, these last two years in a Lancet group, an international group uh, of people who have, uh, are experts in various fields. And I was co-chair with two other persons uh, of a subgroup on uh, groups at risk or, or, or group disadvantaged groups in society and how they have been particularly touched by the pandemic. And uh, that report too uh, is available in the public domain. Uh, it was uh, our recommendations, policy recommendations of that group uh, have been published in a, in a medical journal, uh, in a very prestigious medical journal, Lancet, um, a few months ago. And uh, we are submitting to Lamset a global, uh, a global report about the impacts of the pandemic in various ways. But uh, to, to uh, summarize our subgroup's uh, findings, uh, they're very simple. Every group in society that had, was at some sort of disadvantage 
with respect to their access to education, with respect to their access to career development, with their uh, possibility of growth and development of their uh, talents, um, has been adversely affected by the pandemic. And in every other way that you can think of, uh, every disadvantage, a social disadvantage that a person might have in, in, in any country, wherever, if they belong to a category of people who are disadvantaged by the pandemic, the pandemic has only made it worse. So that with respect to education, uh, girls, for instance, who have always been a fragile group uh, in many countries, uh, are in many countries have been pulled out of school uh, because of the pandemic uh, for a variety of, of familial reasons. And many of them are not liable to go back to school. But I might point out that it is not just the pandemic that is at fault. Think of the case uh, of Afghanistan, where uh, the, uh, the retrogression under the Taliban uh, has been simply uh, unbelievably horrible. Uh, this refusal to allow girls access to education, to allow women access to work, uh, has nothing to do with the pandemic. It has everything to do uh, with, with, with blind fanaticism uh, and, and a distorted interpretation uh, of their holy book. So that will be my introduction. And thank you, and a very powerful one too, given the perspectives and the vantage point, I think that you've been able to share your experiences from. Thank you, Dr. Vicar Freiberger. We will convene again in a moment from a more general point of view. If I may then to Professor Michelle Notari. Um, thank, you. thank you very much for um, letting me speak here. I'm very honored to talk to you, all of you and all the audience there. I'm actually more a practitioner, which means I'm on the base of education. I'm educating teacher in Switzerland, which we have, where, where the situation is a little bit different than in places, as you mentioned, in Afghanistan or in remote area where they don't, there, there is no access to either to education or to any technology which would be helpful for bridging distances and or enabling to accede to uh, any 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 kind of, of education. So actually in Switzerland, the situation was a little bit different. Everybody had access, to the, the schools have been closed, but still for a short period of time and everything has been shifted to, to distance learning. And even so, uh, I'm actually um, uh, interested in, in, in mechanisms to enhance the specificity and the quality and the efficiency of education. And the way this shift to, to distance education has happened brought a different didactics which has been improved it means that the didactics which has been used during all these pandemics is transmission didactics where you have that information going from the institution the school to the to the to the to the learner and interaction which happened usually is very fruitful for for enhancing skills which are very important for the for the workforce or also for for the for the for deep learning experiences this uh, this part of, uh, of learning has decreased during this pandemic and nowadays that um, schools is back to normal there's a shift where hopefully also like these skills like collaboration cooperation negotiation conflict resolution face to face it is possible to do it also online but it has been decreased so this part should resume and hopefully this part will help to create um, an educational system which really enables to, uh, people to collaborate, to communicate to each other, even if they are not in the same place and even if you're not in the same level, social or distance level. So that's the thing I would like to try to, to focus on a bit from my point of view, where how even, even if the education is, if it's possible, how to make it even better so we can um, have a future where uh, more people can be reached and more people can have a, a really experience, an education experience, allowing them to have an um, interaction with people where they know and people far away. That is something I would like to point out here in this panel. Thank you so much, Michelle. I, I'm looking forward to asking a couple of questions on that because I think the online and distance learning is a great big conversation about which, how has the impact been and has it been as, as at a standard we, we think it should have been or not? I think that's a great big debate on its own. Um, if I may move to our next wonderful guest, um, Peja Emelson uh, from Sweden, a serial entrepreneur. Always appreciate that. And very involved in, in um, Stockholm Councils, Chef de Cabinet of Paris-based International Chamber of Commerce, uh, illustrious uh, 
involvement with the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences and on the board of the Nobel Prize Outreach. So, Peer, your perspective, please. Thank you. You know, I, I founded a school 22 years ago in Sweden based on personalized education. I have today 35 schools in Sweden uh, with 15,000 students, K-12, and about 30,000 students in 100 schools in India, Saudi Arabia, Holland, the UK, using the same kind of system. If I take the pandemic first, it's very interesting. To me, it opens up a new avenue in education. Education has traditionally been extremely old fashioned. And when you use hybrid solutions, sometimes you're online, you also have to meet the professors. And we have managed to develop new technology and methods during the pandemic. Sweden has been unique because we have never closed schools. India, we have had our schools closed for close to two years. It's very difficult to educate five years old online, the same in Saudi Arabia, but that has enabled us to develop new tools. So when I see that we are coming through the pandemic, I see a number of new positive opportunities in providing a better education, an education that is also based on every learner is different and learn in different ways. On the personal side, I have, during the last two years, been an advisor to UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Peace and Education. And we have developed a new activity, Reimagine Education, that will be launched at UNESCO on the 22nd of uh, March in Paris. It's a program in 250 experts in education from 45 countries that have looked into the future of education. And they up with the conclusion, yes, people are different and they learn in different ways. And that you need to provide education that suits everyone needs. So in a tough period, I see actually lots of taking difficult period for the next coming years. Yeah, thank you. Also incredibly unique because of your perspective as a school operator, too. I think that's incredibly valuable. Um, and finally, to Sir George Bowick. Again, George, uh, I know the Sir is not a, it's a great honor. Um, creation of a teaching school, strategic director of the leadership strategy part of the London Challenge, recognized in 2016 by the Times as one of the 500 most influential people in the United Kingdom. Um, enormous publications, executive coaching. Welcome to you, George, and we'd love your perspective too, please. Thank you very much. Well, I went into the uh, the lockdown down and was caught by surprise because I retired and decided that all I would do is write up all the stuff that I should have written up many years ago and, and publish it. So I appointed someone from the Times to help me in this, and uh, I then found that the community that I support, which is spreads to Canada, as well as United Kingdom and the UEA, who use, use the work that I've developed, um, were suddenly involved in dramatic change to their lives through the pandemic. And from expecting to write about the communities once a term and keep everyone in touch, I found us nearly turning it out every week at one stage. And it's interesting to note that doing a weekly blog, 43 of them have been about the community and how it's got on because things have changed so fast to make people respond to things. So that's the first thing. The, 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 there are two things I'd, li I'd like to point out. One is I'm very interested, like Michelle, about how the system becomes more efficient. And I've spent a lot of time looking at the health service. I use the concept of a teaching school like a teaching hospital to, as a centre of excellence within inside a community which would then share its knowledge with others in that community uh, to, to improve the quality of teaching. And I found it very interesting about how the health service went about dealing with this crisis. And I think there's some interesting reflections on that. And if I could just sort of briefly comment on that. First of all, there was a range of, we started being, there was a range of uh, solutions often. And those solutions came from all sectors not a single solution, but a solutions. The, those solutions also 
quite often weren't grounded in research outcomes. They were grounded in research predictions and people chose to go along that way. And we in the UK particularly have become hung up on waiting for the evidence. And if you wait for the evidence, you don't create anything to get the evidence. And we're sort of trapped in this evidence world at the moment. And it's it's sort of holding us back. The next thing is, I think that um, there was a huge high degree of public scrutiny of the, the decisions that were made, how the vets, the information was put in the public domain. People were clear about what the impact, they could make value choices. I don't think our parents, probably by homeschooling, have had more opportunity to decide whether the process is right or not, but they're not really engaged in this. Also, they've had to deal with a massive amount of disaffection for the population as well and convince people, particularly as a previous speaker talked about, the people with disadvantaged backgrounds who didn't have access. And as you stated, the situation became worse and they became the more vulnerable, especially in the UK, when we missed a fortnight and when everyone else started and we started after the racing season. Um, so we, we lost two weeks and that caused us massive problems to catch up. So I think there's a lot to be learned by just taking some time and thinking about what happened. And finally, the urgency shown by governments to eradicate the virus. We have known for years that the basic literacy and numeracy is holding back society. And yet we still persist in not really tackling it. And the rather joinless view of mine is maybe we've reached the point of herd immunity, where we just accept this is the way it is and we're never going to solve the problem. Unlike with the virus, where we needed to solve the problem. Thank you. Um, no, that's a that's an incredibly uh, important and inflammatory closing remark. I would I would suggest, <laughs> and uh, one no in a, in a wonderful way because I I'd like to I'd like to open the conversation to all of us and and anybody who's going to join us. Uh, using that perhaps as a springboard, George. I think um, if you listen to um, you know, Dr. Vika Freiberger's perspective on a policy level and on a, on a global level, we all know that the policy shifts are incredibly difficult to undertake. We can use that as government rotations, uh, political changes. Uh, we know that academics or the education departments, like the health departments, are often very difficult to shift. Mm -hmm. So what you've just stated about basic literacy and numeracy, I, I believe in context that part of the missing link in the world is often relating back to the earliest years of our children's education, even reaching into early childhood. In Peja, you know that in Sweden, obviously, and in neighboring Finland, etc., the early childhood system is quite evolved. I would suggest that we can really only lay those foundations of numeracy and literacy in the earliest years. It becomes increasingly hard. So I think we're constantly dealing with a bit of a catch-up. So I just wanted to put that out there, that we're talking of the global education systems, but I think we, we often overlook the earliest years as being foundational to the general, the rest of the pyramid, so to speak. But if, if I may, um, Dr. Vika Freiberger, just on the policy issues, how easy, when we say there are changes needed, I mean, you sit on a number of these larger uh, governmental related committees and organizations, how easy is it even to think of challenging norms and paradigms in the educational systems? How, how difficult is that going to be to even live through recommendations on a more national level to change education that has been with us for 150 years in the current format? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, curiously enough, a number of countries have taken advantage uh, of the situation uh, to uh, undertake uh, conceptual uh, changes in their in their educational system and uh, our we had within the unesco group uh, i also was with a group of, of those uh, i had two co-chairs uh, dealing again with disadvantaged groups um, and uh, uh, professor fernando Riemers of of uh, harvard university has just published a book. Uh, in fact, he has published a number of books uh, with his students, where f f anywhere from Kenya to countries in Asia and South America, um, there have been uh, initiatives, and they, they, his students describe these initiatives and how they went about convincing the local population to engage in them. 
to to take a different approach. But if I may take advantage of this opportunity to speak, I'd like to emphasize that one of the things that uh, our UNESCO group uh, emphasizes as crucial is the fact that education is not just the training of, of in, in, if you like, intellectual preparation for adult life. Uh, obviously, uh, numeracy and literacy, uh, digital literacy, uh, uh, those are elementary things uh, children in many parts of the world um, uh, have not access to. Uh, in other parts of the world, adults have access to continuing education, which is one of the other things that, that we emphasize, not just children and, uh, and youngsters who learn, but we should have lifelong learning. That is one of our precepts. And the other one is to recognize that education is certainly for training the mind, but also for training the heart in many ways. And this, uh, this becomes obvious uh, uh, under the pandemic when children were, as in my country, Latvia, uh, there were long periods when, when schools were closed. They were reopened in spite of a quite large, still continuing uh, rates of infection daily. Uh, in our country with a new Omicron variant, the schools reopened and of my four grandchildren, two of them brought back COVID-19 from going back to school. Uh, fortunately, in, in a light form and, and, and they're over it now. And, and I'm, I'm very grateful the, for you know, our faith that it is so. But uh, what is striking is that young children have an instinct which draws them to other children of their own age. And when each of you thinks back on, on, the, on, their own, on their own childhood, I think you will recognize that you learned a lot from your teachers, old-fashioned as they may have been, depending on your age, but you learned a lot from your peers. Uh, you learned a lot during recess. You learned a lot uh, by playing with uh, other children. And in a distance learning situation, this is entirely lacking. Uh, and you, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned earlier the the, the ability to, to to learn skills of of living together with others, uh, confronting uh, other views or other experiences um, without uh, necessarily uh, creating a conflict uh, or or, uh, or losing touch with each other. We had a, a member in our in our subgroup uh, from Peru who was uh, a representative of the indigenous population, the Quechua Indians of, of Peru, and who felt, and, and we added that in our report, that in those countries where it's pertinent, ancient uh, uh, indigenous uh, learning and view, uh, ways of looking at the world uh, should be included in the, uh, in the curriculum uh, as part of the worldview that, that, that a person uh, develops. Uh, because, of course, in countries that have a colonial past, very frequently uh, there's, a, if you like, the conqueror's uh, worldview that dominates and, mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the indigenous populations uh, are, are sort of denigrated uh, and, and looked down upon. And in, in India, it's, it's a case of the castes, of the social castes. Uh, in a country which is supposed to be democratic, if you still have... Uh, untouchables by a different name. They're called Dalit now, but it's uh, it's the same prejudice uh, in many ways that's still uh, present. Uh, obviously, uh, this is not a way to, to get a, a, a coherent and truly democratic country. Uh, very, very important points, because I think also you made a mention about, obviously, when you've been in a socially challenged situation prior to the pandemic, that has just gotten worse. And I think in reference to the school children in Latvia, I think, Peye, just perhaps describe, as you mentioned, hybrid solutions. You you, list, you spoke about the opportunity you've had to view both yeah. the Swedish child and the Indian child, one with closures and one with no closures. What have you seen just in the impact on the child in the, as a comparison in the two countries? I think it's a, a few comments. First, it's interesting. Uh, in a Swedish context or an Indian context, where you start to work also online, partly, some students are much better situation and some do not function. You know, some people are much better off when they are alone. Uh, so I'm getting back to the fact that we have to understand that people learn in so different way. Uh, when it comes to the most of the 
plans for education are decided upon on the national level. Uh, of course, you can decide mathematics is one thing, but you decide how many hours here and there. You know, it's amazing for me to see our children in India Skyping with the children in the UK and talking about when India became free, completely different perceptions. <laughs> or when the students in the UK talk to the students in the US about what happened in the US revolution, completely different perceptions. So my belief is that we will step to step move into situation where we get the more international content in education, in the curriculum, we use the tagline educate to the global generation in a way in the younger, but to get a deeper understanding of the word functions, while of course at the same time respecting traditional values. And in order to do that, uh, I do not, in my experience, I don't believe in just online education and sitting alone. It fits for a few people. You need a smart combination of using the modern technology and getting together and meeting physically, as we all realize now when we have met in this way during a few years. So I think that that's where I see a, a more of a, a working together in the world, getting rid of responsibility in education from nations, uh, moving it to more of a worldwide basis. And of course, the bureaucrats in education get very upset when I say that. But I, I think it's the uh, what's happening now in the world makes it even more important to do that. One more aspect, what I'm doing, I'm running a big program in Haryana in India, where we are providing education, training, skilling for the poorest people. And there you can see, of course, when you do that in a smart way, it doesn't cost very much to get fantastic results. So, because you need to get another sense, how do we get the resources for education for everyone? Uh, in many countries, you have a system by four, five, six percent who pay a lot. They go to their private schools, they got their own systems. Uh, I very much believe in a common system where we have education as far as possible together, and that is a common responsibility for the policymakers to make sure that that happens. Thank you very much. And Michelle, I, I noticed you would like to say something. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I want to jump in also already before. First of all, like the policymakers um, telling that, you know, things in education change very slowly. Actually, we had a crisis which was given by the virus. And there suddenly, even policymakers uh, were more um, keen to, 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 uh, to allow changes in education. So crisis could also be in this case a chance for opening up for different perspectives. And of course, uh, what I mentioned already before, a lot of the, the learning which took place during this uh, period where the shift had to take place within days or weeks, there the, uh, the, the methods which were adop adopted were just, as I mentioned, like the transmission, like I have the, the knowledge and I give it to you and you listen and you try to learn. But as Piet mentioned before, uh, when you have this 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 children from from India talking to the children of um, of uh, of UK about what happened in the story in the history, so they have, you have actually a, a method where you have two concepts of the same thing which go together and try to interchange, to exchange, and this is also the power of media, and it's also something which is relevant to bridge these distances and not I don't talk about the, um, the geographical distance, but the conceptual distance. Of, of understanding of something. And this is very relevant for, for education. It's a different way than having a curriculum which says, now we talk about the colonization of India. And from our perspective or from another perspective, and you have the stakeholders, which are the children in India, the children in, in UK talking about that. So it's possible as well, actually. But these methods are really, uh, if you compare how many, how many, how many hours and, and years have been taught like in distance education by information transition and how many how many years or how many hours it's been taught in collaboration and communication. And now I go back to the, actually the skills which are relevant for the future, beside of having the capability of uh, access of information, which is relevant and really not really fake or quite re relevant, reliable and, uh, and, and correct somehow, you should also have the opportunity to interchange information, to communicate, to collaborate. And, to, in, to, 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 uh, and this collaboration communication can be uh, 
uh, synchronous or also as, uh, asynchronous and there is a lot of potential in there and I think um, education should go there and of course not neglecting what Piet men mentioned as well the opportunity of being together at the same time in the same place and being together and uh, working towards the same goal and this is something which is of course relevant for the future of education as well as the potential of the media and the information technology offers for enhancing and making the education a bit more optimized. Thank you, Michelle. Quick question though back to you is that with regard to you said successes and failures in the online experience, um, would you say that technology advances have certainly made the reality of the online experience a little more plausible and a little more effective? What has been the major hurdles that you've experienced in the online world? Well, uh, I just didn't, I, I didn't hear the last sentence. You, I think it was Sorry, cut on no, my you, you line mentioned, my connection. What was the last no sentence I didn't hear? You mentioned that um, your, in your, when you spoke, you mentioned the successes and failures of the online platform. Perhaps in light of what we've just described, what in your view have been those successes and what do we carry forward with those successes and which areas have failed us even still today with technology? Well, I can speak about Switzerland where the coverage of technology is quite broad. So we have every kid has access to, to, to uh, an internet connection, has access to a device which allow, uh, allows the kids to, to not only to access information, but also to communicate and to interact with this technology because the broadband is, is fine. I, so I cannot talk about other regions. Of course, I know mm -hmm. I'm teaching as well in Hong Kong and I have some project in the Philippines and in Sumatra where the situation is totally different. And of course, there uh, the, the, the approaches. So, so coming back to your questions, the failures actually is that the, the failure comes from the side of the educators, which are not which are not aware of the potential and of the methods and the different ways to, to use this technology. They rely on what they have, uh, they, what they know, which means they could just transmit. That means they, they came back on their storyboards and then they gave, gave the information to the kids and they were not aware. And that is a failure. And of course, this is something which should shift a bit that you use technology as well for information transmission, but also for other, um, for increasing of other skills like procedural skills, communication skills and collaboration skills. This is possible. So that is actually the thing that, that happened during pandemic, the shift to information transmission and less to these other skills. This is, the, from my point of view, the major failure. And the, 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 the success of technology is that really it has been accepted. And this is, it has been accepted by many people which were, which, well, they didn't know or they were, uh, they, they didn't like it, so they had to use it. So I think now the skills also increased of the educator and it's important now to teach them, to educate the educators in order to give, to show them the, the, the whole spectrum of possibility of methods of technologies in order to enhance also the other skills, which are not just the transmission of information. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. George, one of the comments I wanted to go back to that you'd made was around the being trapped in an evidence world. Yes. Um, and I, I think, again, as we look at the challenges we faced and looking at the history of evidence bases in education, what do you view? Can you expand a little bit on the trapped in, in evidence uh, well, world? Well, I, I would have thought Peter wouldn't have been successful if he'd waited for the evidence to show that uh, his approach worked. I think that, you know, it 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 the it's a difficult area for us because we've invested a lot of time in the UK making policy now based around evidence. The first issue is that the, you can really produce any evidence to suit anything, so that becomes quite a major issue. But it, it, the danger is it it doesn't actually because it's always behind the process. It might point you in the right direction, but it actually delays. In our work, we talk about three pieces of knowledge that you need to have. One is best practice the people who are actually solving that solution now in the real world. The second group are the people that are innovating and taking it further. And the third group are the researchers. And of course, they follow in the wake of the others. If you want to change things, you can't depend on the research. I mean, a classical example today, yesterday, was published the information that the predictions made of the in the UK were double the amount of people at the minimum amount were likely to die from the latest outbreak compared to what happened. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, even with that sort of knowledge, I would like to, if it's all right with you, I'd just like to go back to, I've been very basic in this conversation, and I want to go back even further more basic. What it has mm. grown up is the need that every child needs to be seen, safe and supported in our system. 
and even in the UK, it's thrown up major issues over the responsibility of, of a education system to actually do that effectively. And with the shift to going home, this made it even more important. And the outcomes, as we've seen in mental health issues and, and so on, and, dis, um, and the issues of disadvantage, have exacerbated this system. And schools have ended up being the one vehicle at the moment to do this. Whether we replace it with someone else in the future, it doesn't, that's for the future. But now that role for schools is absolutely critical. <coughs> uh, I think it's very important. The second point I would make is also, we've talked around the curriculum, it's created in the UK debate about our academic curriculum, whether we have a technical curriculum at all, whether we have a social curriculum at all, the issues we talked about, interaction, and also the locality of that curriculum as well, whether it sits in the locality. And on top of that, as you said, we've been grappling with our past <laughs> because we have a multi, a nation of diverse ethnicity and they don't see the history the same as we see our history, which you've all referred to, our colonisation of the world. So we're in a quite um, turbulent point, I think. It would be nice if we could strike forward and make some decisions about it rather than fudge our way through it without actually getting anywhere. It'd be nice mm -hmm. to get some clarity from all this. But at the moment, we've not been very good at it. Um, we, we're stuck still in an in a archaean system in, 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 in so many different ways and trying to replicate the past. We're gatekeepers for the past rather than the door openers for the future. I, I would agree with that entirely, George. And Peggy, I, th I see you're interesting. Yeah, you're, you're yeah uh, but, um, you know, I have looked quite a lot at how much do we spend on education. And it's also interesting in Sweden, where the local authorities decide how much you spend. And those that spend most spend double of those that spend the least. When I was running an academy in the UK, I think we got £7,000. I was invited to the private school that was a few kilometers from there. They charge £30,000. Uh, so it's very interesting. What the hell do we get for the money? And I think there are enormous possibilities to improve efficiency in education and get better value for those that need education. Uh, I'll give you one example from, from my school system. Our 3,000 teachers, they spend about 30 hours a week teaching. The average in Sweden school is less than 20. Uh, so you can go through, and when I took the, the, the private schools in some of the exclusive private schools, it's much less than that. So uh, if you look at efficient use of money, uh, we could get more. And I'm sorry to say, I no way, even I've brought in specialists, we cannot find any positive correlation on the amount of money spent and the result. So that is well, a I, challenge. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would agree, Michelle. That, that's a challenging question, of course. Uh, and of course, there's like, you know, you cannot quantify education by saying how many words they learn. You know, the thing is actually teaching. What does it mean? Are they in front of the, of the students talking to them or are they helping to develop their skills? So that's the thing, you know, it's like, and you kind of monetize the same. It's not like a factory and you say if you produce 2000 pieces or you, or you produce 20,000 pieces, the factory is more efficient. Efficiency is something quite difficult, especially if you talk about what education is. And if I, if I talk about being able to uh, being aware of deep things of, of, of conceptual knowledge and not about factual knowledge, which is measurable in the article you mentioned, then it's something totally different. So I think this uh, this article you mentioned are biased because they can just measure the factual change of knowledge which is something which, in my point of view, is the, the thing that gets less and less relevant in the future of education. So I, I will not rely on such articles, just in general, from that point of view. Just to rely so, on so, what you No, excellent. Two, two quick thoughts as well is that um, in the South African context, uh, recent academic results have proven, and the last year's grade 12 students, of which 600,000 students ended up going through grade 12, in mathematics alone, it was... The result was not more than 20% of all students scored 30% or more. That is the national outcome. And we spend more per capita here, and also Michelle, we spend more per capita on education in South Africa virtually than anywhere else. 
but the outcomes are abysmal. So we've undertaken, at least what I'm doing in my foundation, is undertaking to renovate the early years to do precisely, Dr. Vika Freiberg, you mentioned, you mentioned heart. Um, I think that is an extremely vital component because I think our children have been so damaged by the last few years. And I think, George, you mentioned that schools are such important places where children are actually held if we can see them independently enough. Perhaps just to summarize, if I can move around, uh, last sort of few seconds of thoughts maybe from Dr. Vicka Freiberger as we have a new three or four minutes to wrap up and then to each of us. Just to remind you that even as we are, are looking to education uh, and ever since stage of enlightenment, uh, humanity has been, been hoping that there are ways of improving humanity uh, uh, through uh, enlightenment, knowledge, uh, and uh, which means concretely also education. And sadly, uh, we must acknowledge uh, that uh, precisely because uh, the intellectual education does not necessarily open the heart, uh, the, 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 and, and it's very difficult to teach empathy. Uh, we, we have recommended that uh, children and, and youngsters be taught empathy with the planet, a sense that we below live in this global village uh, on 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 uh, on this on this moving spaceship, Earth that uh, has limited resources. Uh, but uh, let's only look at at the recent uh, uh, aggression of of Russia against uh, its its uh, peaceful neighbor um, um, Ukraine. And uh, what we find is that people with high levels of education and high levels of talent. Uh, are uh, actually supporting this aggression, are supporting the lies that are at, at the back of it. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter how high the intellect or how high the, the level of education or, or the other talents a person may have, uh, the, the capacity for harming others, for harming one's fellow man, for being aggressive, for being evil, uh, is sadly also part uh, of human nature, and uh, the, I think we, for the future of humanity, we will somehow have to find a way of curbing these aggressive instincts that are very much in evidence, even uh, everywhere we look today. Uh, absolutely. Michelle, just a quick uh, 30 seconds, perhaps. I think I can follow what Willy Weyer was mentioning before. I think the education of the heart is something from the pedagogical, you know, Pestalozzi was one having head, heart and hands. So you have this really very basic and uh, original uh, pedagogical points of view. And of course, curbing, curbing aggression is something quite difficult, but trying to, uh, to manage it in a different way or deliver or putting in the der derivating in another direction than just uh, hitting or, or killing your neighbor. That is something that is very important and also should be part of any sort of formal and non-formal education from the moment you, you, go, go, you, 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 you get born, born till you die. That's something which is, uh, of course, I, I understand and I support what you said. Agreed. And then, George, a uh, few thoughts quickly and then uh, to pay you. No, I, I, it's been a real privilege to listen to the comments being made. And uh, I think the frightening aspect is that we, none of us would have actually felt in, a, in our education systems before these events that we would have actually educated the population that human beings could behave in this sort of way. It would have been considered a very reactionary approach by us all. And it's quite frightening that humanity is reminding us of the inhumanity to one another. It's scary. World. Absolutely. It is indeed. And Pierre, final thoughts from you? As Juan so many people still believe in education, it's a meritocracy. You need to get com people competing against each other to get the positions. I have changed my mind completely there. I think education is aimed to provide each other to compete to themselves and to reach the better results themselves, not to compete with others. And that's a very interesting thought when you look at all the systems we have to get people into higher education. That's a wonderfully thought-provoking idea because, of course, the competition is at the heart of our economic and social developments. Um, I would love to just say thank you to each of you. It's been an honor to share this panel with all of you. Um, and let's hope that we move into happier and more peaceful times in the very near future for the planet and as a whole. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Bye. you.